But with their recent discussions concerning the nature of consciousness, experience, that kind of thing, um, it's becoming apparent that, at least for the purpose of this discussion and the uh, vocabulary that we've used uh, so far, we're nearing the edge of the utility of language. We're getting towards uh, territory in which at least the English language and all the assumptions that are built into it uh, is starting to falter. Now for most people at this point they just sort of say, okay, I've, I've pushed this as far as I can go beyond that, I don't know. And they're okay with that. Now I don't have a problem with that at all. Um, and when you do try to engage people who think that way, in ideas of, let's say, um, I don't know, what's beyond the edge of the universe, uh, or what's the uh, end of time look like, or whatever, they just uh, haven't got a clue. Okay, fair enough, that's wonderful. I got, no, I have no problem with that whatsoever. But let's say that you do want to engage in that kind of um, speculation. You do want to sort of try and wrap your head around such things. Well, have you ever met a proficient mathematician, say for example, who happens to have a bust of, I don't know, Archimedes or Pythagoras on his desk, or a guy who's into, uh, or a, a physicist or whatever, who's got a portrait of, that famous portrait of Einstein, ah, going like that, on the wall. That's an interesting sort of juxtaposition of the rational and the irrational, isn't it? Um, the person who's into the really dry sciences, physics, mathematics, has an emotional attachment to them that he expresses by his admiration of his sort of, I don't know, saints, would you call them? Uh, his role models. Um, in a sense, he's sort of looking up to these people. They're his teachers, his guru, almost. Uh, it's almost an emotional attachment. Emotional um, emotional uh, he's being drawn in an emotional way towards something that one doesn't normally associate with the emotions people say things like I'm passionate about uh, advanced trigonometry we're not supposed to be passionate about something like that but a lot of people are and that's what makes them even better as a matter of fact because they want to know they get some sort of rush out of exploring the intricacies of math, science, biology, uh, anthropology, whatever. It means something to them. The experience uh, of delving deeper into these things has value to them. Has uh, There's a strong positive reward at the end of, or at least with, with the uncovering of each new bit of knowledge, there is a rush of discovery. Uh, some even say it's an ecstatic feeling. Well, that, if you ask me, uh, can let us know that uh, the dry sciences aren't really nearly as dry as we think that they are. Um, or at least our experience of them is nowhere near as dry as we think they are. Uh, the guy with his Coke bottles and his pens in his pocket and his astronaut haircut, who's... Uh, supposedly this kind of human machine who's just sitting at his keypad all day typing away may be um, engaging in something along the lines of his version of the quest for the Holy Grail. He may be looking for the meaning of life. It's just that the way that he does this to us, to an outside person, looks dry and um, impersonal and unapproachable and odd. Um, sure, it's, uh, it's admirable that we have uh, Mr. Spocks around, but I really wouldn't want to be one because what's the, the, their lives are all empty. Well, no, they just look empty to people who are not like them. That makes me suspicious of anyone who says that we've got to, or not suspicious of them, but any, any argument that says we've got to remove any kind of emotion um, from anything, or bias, or desire, or anything, will, uh, before we can get anywhere, before we can actually see things for what they actually are. Because the two 
if you ask me, are two sides of the same coin. Um, if you try and split the two, you actually weaken your ability to get at the truth, to get at, or to make progress in terms of learning about the universe around you. Um, an interesting example of that are the uh, sutras of Bodhyana. Uh, he's an ancient Indian mathematician, I guess you could call him that. Um, but his uh, texts were mostly about um, mathematics, advanced mathematics, um, all kinds of stuff like pi. But he wrote in a very poetic, religious kind of language. Uh, he wrote about pi in what we would call a poem, <laughs> um, pro possibly before the um, ancient Greeks came up with the idea. But India is an interesting case because it's never quite split the two, the emotional and the intellectual, the way that the West has. It's never made things quite as clinical. Um, and this sort of clinical approach to everything is somewhat new, and it, it somewhat misrepresents the ancient knowledge tradition that came down to us from the ancient Greeks. The Pythagoreans, for example, were what we would probably now recognize as a cult, and Pythagoras was uh, a guru. Um, they believed in all kinds of stuff that we would find odd and airy fairy or whatever, but their mathematics was pretty impressive, like Bodhyana. Um, the ancient Greeks understood that, or they didn't understand, but they they sort of said, okay, the Apollonian and the Dionysian have to coexist in, because each one of those is part of who we are. And it didn't seem utterly strange to them that someone trying to learn about mathematics, physics, uh, this sort of thing, would also have a strongly what we might call religious uh, connection to it all. We've broken that. We've, we've put the two in two separate compartments, but a lot of science geek types, uh, people such as Carl Sagan, um, sort of say, look, we're, we may have made a mistake here uh, in splitting these two halves of the brain. Because if we just go in a completely rational way, we start to, after a certain point, ask ourselves, why are we even doing this? Because the only way you can answer that question, why do I bother trying to search for all this stuff, is kind of in an emotional sort of way. Um, and I think that we don't do ourselves any good by ruling out possibilities for exploring the ultimate nature of reality, which is why I wear this. This is a an ohm that I picked up in India in 1989 in the city of Varanasi. I don't follow any Hindu stuff. I don't, uh, I don't, uh, I have no desire to sit in a lotus position or get a guru or, uh, I don't know, uh, chant mantras or anything like that. But I found in a lot of, at a formative period in my life, a lot of interesting ideas couched in a language that was completely different from the one that I was used to. The Western language is clinical and dry. The Indian language of discussing the big questions is couched in metaphor, religion, myth, and magic even. But if you can get beyond that sort of thing, if you can actually uh, uh, keep going um, and sort of not get distracted by the multi-armed gods and the tales of demons and um, the screwy uh, Western converts to Hinduism that uh, annoyingly chant mantras in the streets of our big cities. If you can get beyond all of that, uh, there's some pretty interesting and mind-blowing stuff. Um, I mentioned to a conference report yesterday that what do you do when you want to actually go beyond the limits of physical science? Because, as I say, the Western kind of way of looking at things seems to falter at a certain point, or at least the, le the Western language. Um, but you don't want to get infected by all the mumbo-jumbo that's in religion, because um, when you start using things like, okay, let's talk about the ethical implications of the Sermon on the Mount, a lot of people's minds switch off. They say, okay, I, I don't want to have anything to do with that, that's religion, and we all know that religion, as uh, Mr. Carlin said, is bullshit. Well, that's kind of a closed-minded 
approach, but I understand it. I understand why people shy away from this kind of thing. I think that we don't do ourselves any good by ruling things out. And one of the reasons for that came up yesterday when we were discussing the limits of language. The I mentioned the Indians because they actually do have a vocabulary to deal with a lot of stuff that Westerners, um, or at least the Western vocabulary, tends to falter at. Uh, they can talk about experience, the different levels of experience, the different levels of consciousness, where consciousness may have come from, may have gone, whatever, in a far more, if you ask me, thorough way. But there's that terrible fear of infection, <laughs> that terrible aversion. I don't want to get into that, because that's just um, multi-armed gods. Um, uh, that's just... Uh, uh, taking things at face value. That's just religion. I don't want anything to do with that. I understand that aversion. But I suppose I would counter that with what's more important? Finding your answers? Or making progress even? Or um, worrying about little infections? I think that if you're if you're actually up to the challenge, if you actually do want to go forward, I guess, in your speculations, you're willing to risk that sort of thing. You're willing to risk um, stepping out into the jungle where there's a lot of traps that you never knew were there before because that uh, prize that you'll find in the ancient ruins lost in the jungles uh, is worth the effort. Um, Indiana Jones thought so. <laughs> um, but anyway, I do think that uh, that there are languages out there, or there are discourses out there that can go a lot further than our current version, our current discourse. But it takes guts, and as conference report said, it takes, I would say, humility. Um, to explore them. Thank you.